Hey everybody, welcome to our virtual Bible study. Thanks for tuning in tonight. If you're following our current series on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, this is lesson number six. Lesson number six in our current study of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. So go ahead and watch this video. But I would encourage you, if you've not seen the previous five lessons and the introduction that goes along with it, please go back and watch those two. Uh, we're trying to dig into every single detail about the birth of our Lord. And because he was born of a virgin, all of it centers on, in some way or another, the virgin conception. So go back and watch those. They're all archived. Uh, they'll be under the heading of the virgin birth. So just go back and, and view those and do that. Be prepped going into lesson number seven. And maybe you've already watched those videos, which is a great thing, which means you're ready for lesson number six. And tonight we're going to be talking about the dating of the Lord's birth. Can we date the birth of Jesus? All right, more on that in just a minute. If you're tuning in with us tonight, you've never watched this program before, you're brand new to the program then may we encourage you, if you're on YouTube, to go ahead and hit that subscribe button right below the video. And we've explained so many times in the past, this is beneficial for us, not for money. We do not make money on the programming. But we're trying to boost our visibility on YouTube. And we do that through subscriptions, because subscription usually means more views. And we're trying to translate that into more views per video. So please do that. There's also an option to share the video. You can go right below the video and there's you can share it on Facebook or another social media site. You can even email the link to that YouTube video to a friend or a family member, somebody that you want to see it, and send it to them. So please consider some of those options for us, especially the subscription to help us out. Subscription service is free on YouTube. doesn't cost you a dime. And you never miss content. That's the advantage to you. But for us, it boosts our viewership and visibility. Now, if you're on Facebook, a little bit something different. We need you to help us by sharing the video on your timeline. We are a public page. We don't do friend requests and send out friend requests and such. Um, we have to be followed as a public page. But we're accessible to everybody. But they don't know we're here unless they see us. So a great way to help people see our, our uh, Facebook page is to share content. So we gain access to all of your friends and we get to share this video as well to all of your friends. So please help us out in doing that in every way that you can think that we need your help. We need it to make the gospel widespread and well-known. So please help us out. Okay, lesson number six. Okay, so we, uh, we've introduced our topic. We've, we started at the very beginning, you know, in our second lesson with Genesis 3. We've worked our way up through the genealogies of Jesus. We've looked at a few things. We even spent some last uh, time in the last lesson dealing with the historical and social context of Jesus' birth. In this lesson, we ask the question, can we date the Lord's birth? Is there a way to attach a day to it, a date, a time frame to it? So we're going to, it's a, it's often hotly contested. So we're going to talk about that in this lesson. Now, in other videos, I have explained how I like to follow the discussion questions that we have for our in-person live class. So if you were to come and be a part of the in-person live class, on Wednesday evenings. Uh, we'll go through the questions that I go through with you on the video series, but we have back and forth give and take. There's a lot of independent study by members of the congregation. We have some that come very well prepared, and it's always a great class. There's such great insight, and there's always a lot more than what I can give you in this pre-recorded video series. So I encourage you to come to the live in-person class on Wednesday evenings. But if you're unable, then we try to do our best to cover all the bases. I try to think of everything when we're going through this. So here comes question number one. 
All right, question number one, what are some common views that you've heard or experienced, maybe you've experienced these, about the dating of the virgin birth of Jesus? Why do you think ex people accept views like this? And why didn't God tell us specifically when Jesus was born? Isn't it interesting that he never told us when he was born? Why didn't he do that? Okay, so let's, chart, let, let's try to tackle this series of questions the best we can. Um, I have heard some people push the birth of Jesus back to January. And there's a reason why they would say January the 6th. It's based on some early dating um, in religious circles. Uh, January 6th had to do with a certain winter calendar, and so they would push it back to that. But the most common view, you, you know this, the most common view of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and the most commonly accepted view. It's not, just, it's not just the most common view. It's the most commonly accepted view is that Jesus was born on December the 25th and, of course, Christmas Day. So Christ was born on Christmas Day. You hear people sing about it. People write about it. People talk about it. The common assumption is that Jesus was born on Christmas Day, December the 25th. And what's interesting is that the scholars who would hint toward a December the 25th birthday will at the same time in their writings and reflection on the Bible text openly admit, or at least be spurious about that December the 25th date, they'll openly admit sometimes that we just simply don't know when the Lord was born, but they'll at least be, at the very minimum, be spurious about it, right? They'll be doubtful about whether that could actually be the date or not. So the question is, I guess, how did we come to December the 25th as the date of the Lord's birth? How did we get there? If it's not from Scripture, because Jesus, Jesus never said anything about it, and certainly the Father never had people write about it. So... Here are some common theories as to how we got to where we are. And I wouldn't say theories in the sense they're unproven. It's just like, what I guess what I'm saying is there are a number of factors that probably led to that, and I don't think any single factor was the determining factor. I think all of them together probably had something to do with it. It's probably a better way of phrasing that, because what I'm about to say is not theorized. It's just these are, these are contributing factors to what eventually became the 25th of December as the birthday of Jesus. All right, so there was a man by the name of Sextus Julius Africanus. Uh, he was a Roman, and uh, he advanced the belief that Jesus was conceived on March the 25th. He believed that strongly and advocated for that view. Well, now, if you add nine months, you end up with December the 25th. Um, so nine months later would be December the 25th. So he started advancing that view, and maybe that was like a seed in the minds of people. In the 3rd century, right, so we move forward a little bit. In the 3rd century, Rome celebrated the winter solstice, which kind of coincided with that date of December the 25th. And I know it included days before that, but the winter solstice was right around that date. And then those in Rome started recognizing Christians... Um, or Christmas, I should say, on December the 25th in AD 336 because of the influence of Emperor Constantine. Now, he was a supporter of Christianity, Constantine was. And many believe that his adoption of Christmas on December the 25th, which they started attributing the birthday of Jesus to that date, was actually sort of a practical and political move on his part to kind of subdue and suppress pagan influence in Rome, because he was a fan of Christianity. There's no question about that. Um, but maybe he did that as a way of sort of decreasing pagan festivals that had sort of saturated Rome and especially the month of December. Um, the eastern countries, when, when this started, initially kind of stayed with that January date that I talked about earlier, but December the 25th was universally accepted by the 9th century. Um, so what were those pagan festivals? Well, I know that there are people who refute this, but it's undeniable that this was actually taking place in Rome. 
what they refute is whether this was a contributing factor or not. But I think if you if you put all these together, they were all contributing factors. It's like this. You stuck everything in a blender and mixed it together, and you got December the 25th as the birthday of Jesus. That's what came out of it. Um, so there was um, a festival known as Saturnalia. Saturnalia. Um, it was a rogue Roman pagan festival that celebrated um, Saturn, the Greek god Saturn. It was celebrated in Rome in honor of the Greek god Saturn, who was the god, the mythical god of agriculture and time. You also had at that time <clears throat> the cult of Sol Invictus, or the unconquered sun, the cult of the unconquered sun. And in the third century, they were celebrating a festival on December the 25th in honor of, again, pagan deities. So there's a real good possibility that part of what motivated Constantine to develop, and, and when I say this, it was not based on Scripture. I want to be very clear, it's not based on Scripture, but to develop sort of out of the blue, um, almost a, a pragmatic approach to alleviating Rome from the burden of paganism, because he didn't like paganism. I say that because it's really what he did was almost syncretistic. It was almost like he blended paganism with Christianity to try to suppress paganism. But he ended up with an impure version of Christianity um, in an effort to stop the pagans. And I think all of that together had an influence on their sort of this assumption that came out of this that December the 25th was the day that Christ was born. And when Rome, and I should say Catholicism, adopted the Gregorian calendar in 1582, December the 25th was formally fixed as the date of Jesus' birth. So why would that be accepted if it's not in Scripture? Why would anybody believe that if it's just some sort of compromise on the part of Constantine and a few other people before that who just made conjectures that was theorized about it and never had proof about it? Why would people accept that? as the date of Jesus. Well, a lot of people today accept it because of the influence of family. If you grow up in a household and you've been told all your life that December the 25th is when Jesus was born, you're probably going to believe that if you don't investigate. Or maybe friends believe it and you don't want to be different than your friends and so the peer pressure lets you accept that. Or culture, American culture, since you know we emphasize that a lot this time of year. I know there are some who are very anti-Christmas and very anti the birth of Jesus and every religious connotation to it um, from a cultural perspective. And obviously from a, a religious perspective, if it's without authority, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, but they're very opposed to it for, because they're secular, right? And they don't want any trace of religion in American culture. And so maybe there's the fear of going against culture, but at the same time, there's a lot of people in culture who believe that December the 25th is the birthday of Jesus. And then Maybe prominent teachers in our life have said that. Maybe a religious teacher or a preacher has been telling us that, and so we believe that. Some of it might be the fear of questioning commonly accepted views. If this is just believed, why question it? We get, you know, it's comfortable. We get along with it. Maybe there's a lack of honesty on some people. It's certainly a lack of information or research, and a lack of Bible knowledge. I think it goes right along with that because people um, who believe the narrative that's being put forward, probably haven't done a lot of research in the Scripture on the birth of Jesus Christ. So why didn't God tell us if there's such a controversy over that? Why didn't God tell us when Jesus was born and solve the dilemma? Well, simply because he did not want the birth of Jesus celebrated formally like we do with other things. For example, like the Lord's death. We have a formal weekly commemoration of the Lord's death in the Lord's Supper. Every week we gather and we take unleavened bread and fruit of the vine because we're commanded, we're shown by example in the Bible we should do that to commemorate the Lord's death. He wants that done, but he never told us about the Lord's birth. And while we honor and we respect the Lord's birth, we celebrate it in the sense of we are so grateful to God that it happened because he couldn't be who he was without the virgin birth. He doesn't want it formally commemorated. There's nothing in the Bible to speak of the celebration, formally, celebra formally celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. I always think of this passage in Galatians 4. In verse 9 uh, through verse 11, 
when Paul talks about religious festivals, and he says, you observe days and times and seasons. And he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. These are things they should not have been doing, but they these are things to which they had attached religious significance, where they should never have done that. And Paul said, I'm, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I'm afraid I've converted you pointlessly if, if you're just going to go back to observing man-made religious days. And to set a formal date on the birth of Jesus, to set a date and say, this is the day he was born, we're going to have formal celebration. That's man-made. That is not of God because God never told us the date. And Paul warned the Galatians of doing in principle the same thing. Colossians 3.17 tells us that whatever we do, in word or deed, whatever it is, religiously, it must be done in the name of Jesus Christ. It must be done by his authority. So we are bound to the authority of of the scriptures. And if the Bible does not tell us to do something, we had better not be doing it, right? We better not be adding to the Word of God. <clears throat> now, number two, what evidences exist in the story of the virgin birth that would demonstrate that the common narrative is untrue? The common narrative is, well, you see it in nativity scenes, right? You have three wise men standing before the manger of Jesus. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, and the, the star is right over the top of that. Um, is that the common, is, is that common narrative true? Or is there anything in the Bible that would show that what perhaps we've been told is not true, including the dating of the Lord's birth? For example, what does the Bible really teach about the wise men and when they saw Jesus? This would be a way of, of testing the common narrative. Now, the easiest way to understand the common narrative again, is to understand the nativity scene. Usually it's shepherds looking up at a star, right? They're looking up at a star. Or it's three wise men standing before the manger and the baby Jesus. So let's run through a few of those, and uh, let's see how those details pan out against Scripture, against that, and, and see how Scripture stands against the commonly advanced narrative of December the 25th, Jesus was born, and the three wise men stood right before him. All right, so here's the first thing. Let's just take the example of the shepherds. Let's, let's do the shepherds for just a minute. Uh, go with me to Matthew chapter 2. I mean, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And I want us to go to Luke chapter 2, and I want to start in verse 8. All right, so Luke chapter 2, and go with me to verse 8. Give you a second to get there. And look at verse 8. Verse 8 is really important. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. That's really important. Keeping watch over their flock by night. The angel of the Lord stood before them in verse 9. The glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings uh, of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And uh, the, he finishes his message when the angel goes away. Verse 15, that the shepherds said to one another, Let's now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they'd see him, they made widely known the saying, that was told them concerning the child. So obviously they make it to go see the Lord. Now, there's nothing hard to understand about the story, but it does not fit what we're commonly told, for example, in nativity scenes about the shepherds. Shepherds are often depicted. They're looking up and they see a star. That is nowhere in the text. But I'll tell you what makes this really interesting. Um, I, I know that there are some who argue this has no bearing uh, on the proposed date. This doesn't have any effect on the date since the shepherds, what they'll say is shepherds in other parts of the world were clearly out in the fields in December. But what what shepherds are doing in the Himalayas is not the same thing as what they were doing in Palestine. And in Palestine, verse 8 is the key. When it says there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, they were currently doing that. And, and this, of course, the second part of that would be there was no star. They did not see a star. They had the angel appear to them. And the angel told them where to go and guided them to the baby Jesus. But in Palestine, 
shepherds were in the fields from spring until early October-ish, right? Not, not beyond October, but right, maybe extending into October a week or two. They returned from the fields because of the weather seeking protection and warmth. That was the standard in Palestine in this day. And so if, in verse 8, the birth of Jesus occurs while shepherds are still in the field, it was not in December, the, in December and certainly not on December the 25th. So it tells us that they were in the fields near Bethlehem, so the birth could not have been later than October because of what we know. So we, we at least know spring to October because they were in the field. Now we'll refine that, but we know that it had to be sometime during that time frame. Now let's look at the wise men. If you look at a, a nativity scene, most of the nativity scenes have three wise men standing before Jesus. So go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. That story begins for us in verse 1. Uh, Herod, when he heard this, verse 3, he was troubled. He gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. He inquired. And so in verse 7, he secretly calls the wise men. He determined from them what time the star appeared. Uh, because they, they were the ones that saw the star, right? And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him. And when they heard the king, they departed. Of course, they never go back. They never go back. The star which they had seen in the east, the, they were the ones that saw the star, went before them till they it came and stood over the young child where Jesus was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced, they were exceeding glad. And when they came to the house, not the stables, they saw the young child, not a babe, with Mary, and, uh, his, uh, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. So a common accepted view that goes along with the traditional December the 25th is the wise men came and they worshipped Jesus when he was a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. You see it in every nativity scene nearly, unless it's of the shepherds. The shepherds and the wise men are often standing together. This is not the case because in verse 11, they arrived at the house. And when they arrived, Jesus was, according to the text, by translation and original, he was a young child. He was not a baby anymore. They didn't make it until Jesus was a little bit older. What this means to us is that the commonly spun narrative that December the 25th is the birthday of Jesus and it's depicted with all these little nuances is, is built on false premises. And it, it should what it should do is make every single person question the truthfulness of that whole narrative, including the dating of the Lord's birth. Okay? So if some parts of it are false, and it's, it's typically depicted not true, then, then maybe the dating of it is wrong. So maybe we need to say, well, was he really born on December the 25th? Can we really know that he was born then? So I want us to do this. I, I cannot tell you the date, but I can give you a pretty good ballpark when Jesus was born. And I know this, but, it, but I know it not because it's my think so, because but because it's Bible. Go with me to Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. All right, Luke chapter one. Do you remember a few lessons ago we talked about the birth of John and the significance of John's birth to the virgin birth? It was very important to the virgin conception of Jesus. Go back and view that lesson if you've not seen it. Luke 1, verse 5 is really important. Verse 5. There was, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Now, you remember Zacharias is the father of John, and Elizabeth is his wife. She's the mother of John. Zacharias, he was a certain priest, and notice, of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. And according to verse 6, they're very faithful people. Can't wait to meet them in heaven one day, right? Zacharias and Elizabeth, what great people they must have been to have been blessed with such a privilege of bearing John into this world, the forerunner of Jesus. And remember, we said they're kin to Jesus somehow, okay? So they're, they're related to him, and this is going to all play out in just a second. In verse 5, Zacharias was a priest after the order of Abijah. At this time, Jewish priests were divided into 24, divided in, in 24th, in 24 courses throughout the year. 
And as their, as their time rotated around, they had a service in the temple. In 1 Chronicles 24, verse 1, we learn in verse 10 of 1 Chronicles 24 that Abijah was the eighth course. Right? So they had 24 courses. Abijah's course was the eighth course out of all those courses. Their cycle occurred on the 10th week of the priestly cycle. That's when Abijah's cycle out of all those courses, the eighth course was the 10th week of the priestly cycle, starting on the second Sabbath of Sivan, the month of Sivan, which is like uh, the end of May, June, right? Mid-May or June. All right, so watch this carefully. Zacharias is serving in that course according to verse 8. So it was, verse 8, that while he was serving as priest before God, now he's actually laboring, which means maybe late May, early June. Let's just say June, May, right? He's right in that time frame. That is the time that they, that Elizabeth becomes pregnant with John. They conceive, and John is in, he's conceived in Elizabeth's belly, okay? That happens likely in June, right? Because you have a... Um, He's serving, and then you have all these things take place. You know, he's resistant at first, so let's push it back, say June. Add nine months to that. John was born in March, right? Pregnant in June, born in March. Now watch this. Luke chapter 1, same chapter, verse 26. In the sixth month, that'd be the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth and makes the announcement that Mary's pregnant. Then drop down to verse 36. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month. John was six months older than Jesus, right? It says it right there. If John was born in March, you add six months to that, then Jesus was born sometime in September. That's the month of Tishri. So he was born in Tishri in the month of March. That also makes sense if we maintain, and all of us do, that Jesus was 33 and a half years old when he died. Then you add six months to that, and you end up at time of Passover, but not December. Now, when in September? I don't know. Could it have been a little later, maybe early October? I guess it could have been. But it's more likely that it was probably September, maybe early September, maybe mid to late September, but probably not another month, given the fact that John would have been born in March. And he would have been born in September. That's how math works. But not December. But even then, I don't know the date. You can't tell me, well, my birthday's on the 11th. I'd like to know that Jesus was born on the 11th or the 12th. I don't know that he was. Maybe he was. I have no idea. None of us know because God didn't tell us because he does not want the birth of Jesus formally celebrated. He wants it honored and revered and our hearts to be full of gratitude for that event. But he never told us to celebrate it like he did, for example, the Lord's Supper, the death of Jesus. So when was Jesus born? Probably in September, not in December, not a winter month. All the evidence would legislate against that. But even then, we don't know the exact date. But what a great study, right? Isn't it interesting to go through that? Because the, the Bible does give us a, a hint at when Jesus was born based on when John was born. And that's our starting point for that. Okay. Come back next lesson, and we will plug away at our study of the virgin birth. I hope this is really informative for you and really helpful, encouraging, and uh, faith-building and convicting. We want it to be all those things. I'll see you next time. Until then, know that I love you, and, and I really truly mean that. And God loves you even more than I do. If you have questions, let me know. I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you or on the phone, but at more more face-to-face. -face. I'd, I'd just love to sit down with an open Bible and talk about these things. Uh, we'll not be unkind. I'll even buy you a cup of coffee. We'll just go sit down and have a cup of coffee somewhere and talk about these things. And um, I'll see you next time. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Appreciate it very much.